My special guest today is a multi-award winning storyteller. Her talent shines bright as both an acclaimed actress and writer on stage, screen and radio. She really is one of the finest creatives this country has ever produced and someone we can all be very proud of. Ladies and gents worldwide, Jamila's back. Make some noise of a mighty Lalita Chakrabarti. Lalita, <laughs> welcome to the Bill podcast. Thank you very much, Oliver. Well, it's, uh, it's an uncertain time in your industry, isn't it? I mean, we're having this chat earlier than we'd planned because your your new theatre production has, has been scuppered slightly by uh, by lockdown. So how are you? How has all of this happening again affected your career and, and your industry as a whole? Uh, well, I think like everyone else, it's uh, chaos, but people are working through it in really innovative ways to try and make make it work you know so the play that um uh i was in rehearsals for that i've written is called him and it's at the almeida in london um and we had done one week of rehearsals before christmas because we knew we had to spread it out a bit and then we came back in the new year and then locked down on the tuesday so we did one more day and locked down but the almeida being very innovative and we all knew that this was a possibility it's a everybody is juggling aren't they trying to make things work and because it's a two-hander so it's quite a small intimate contained play um we all just went yeah let's try and make it happen so we're going back into rehearsals next week and then we will either live stream it um or uh live perform it we'll see what happens with uh the world oh wow <laughs> dramatic, isn't it? oh good yeah. on you oh that's fantastic you know i've interviewed a lot of older actors and met, and met and they talk about the sort of decline of repertory theatre, for example, that, that sort of way people hark back to a, a time now gone. How do we prevent, in 20 years' time, people looking back as 2020 and COVID as, as, a, as, a, as a defining moment in, in theatre in a negative way? How, how do we keep soldiering on and keeping theatre alive? I think there is the negative because obviously everyone's struggling financially and will they survive is the question for every every subsidised theatre in the country. And some of them have had to decide, no, they won't for the moment. Um, but I also think what, it, what it's really clarified is our need for theatre. So everybody, even people who don't go to the theatre regularly, want to get out, don't they? You want to get out, you want to go and have a meal, you want to go to the cinema. I mean, often we watch videos at home, not videos, but you know, on TV, you watch films at home. But I want to go to a big screen, I want to go out and have those, um, the pleasures that were available to us before. And I think regional theatre is going to really, if they survive, which is the dark side of it, but will really flourish under the desire for people to support their local um, place. And tell us about the story of him and how did it come about? Um, it came about because I've been writing quite big plays in the last uh, two or three years, you know, big casts, big sort of spectacular things. And I, I wanted to write something small. I thought, oh, it would be easier for a start. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and just to write something intimate between two actors, something that is total theatre, almost requires nothing, just two people and a relationship. It's basically about two men who meet for the first time at a funeral, two 50-year-old men, um, and they realise that they have more in common than they ever imagined. So they're strangers, but actually they have a very shared history. And it's about their relationship. Uh, and I wanted to look at love between two men that was neither romantic nor physical, because I have watched my family and members of my family and my friends, my male friends, and there is a... I mean, you're a guy, so you'll know, but to me, who sort of is an observer of men, there's a subtlety and a delicacy and a, a, a sort of a vulnerability, as well as all the other stuff that we're used to. Um, but there is a detail in relationships of men that I haven't seen on stage, and I wanted to show that. Oh, so wow. That's what it oh, but as soon as you said that, I, I thought back, I was transported back to being 18 years old playing snooker with my mates in a in a in a club in Beverly in Yorkshire <laughs> where for some reason they only had two albums that they played in this club one of which was Celine Dion's greatest hits <laughs> and you'd literally have like these you know big burly Yorkshire lads 
almost in tears playing snooker to my heart will go on as if it's the last <laughs> shot they're ever going to play. Uh, <laughs> you see that image? You would never imagine, would no. you? See his image. <laughs> it's exactly that. And, and him, the play, has got live music in it and it's the and, and it's eight they're, because they're 50 they're looking back in their lives oh. and sharing stories so it's 80s hip-hop classic oh. tune that the actors will perform so oh. it's a it's it's not a musical but it's a play with music about this relationship with, between these two men but hopefully will exactly capture that feeling of you in that snooker club <laughs> <laughs> and it's well it stars your equally brilliantly talented husband adrian lester so yeah. I, I, I love the fact that you guys have collaborated so often together because it's a notorious a, a notoriously difficult business anyway, isn't it? And yeah. when you vote when you've got your own careers, in your case both very successful, but not everyone can gel to the extent where they could work together. No. So how no. what was the moment where you realised that you two could do that and and actually produce produce stuff together and work together yeah uh it's been a really long time i mean we've developed that over a very long time so we've been together um god i think we've been together 33 years wow since we were teenagers and so it's been a really long slow burn and we had a a, a theater company a, a profit share theater company which for those who don't know means that you're not paid which we ran for a couple of years and that was probably the first thing and it was difficult you know because we were juggling our own emerging careers and then trying to do this theater for free and get people in to do stuff for free um but we learned a lot so there were good things and then there were tough things so through the years we've done more and more so when adrian was in hustle i guested which was just i got the job it wasn't anything else but but we had a scene together which was really uh brilliant and strange but great actually so little elements have built up over the years and then we did a three-part documentary together for the bbc called when romeo met juliet i remember it um, well do you remember it yeah. it's because we're from birmingham and it was this school's um production of of Romeo and Juliet from schools that uh, were similar to the schools that he and I went to. So he went to a big sprawling state school that in his memory wasn't very good. And I went to a, a private Catholic school of girls, which in my memory was good. And so the children in the documentary were from those kinds of schools and they came together to do a, a production of Romeo and Juliet in Coventry. That was great because that was us just working out right what we're we going to do with the kids what workshops are we going to do what we're we going to try and teach them so we've we've built up this um thing that you see now quite slowly and and found a language with which to work with each other and now it's just great because we both do our own thing as well yeah so when we come together to work it's really exciting shorthand there's a lot of shorthand and, and presumably you you know because it's a it's a craft you can always hone. You're always learning. And I guess you, you're still surprising each other, presumably. It's kind of endless in that regard, I, I, yeah. I assume. you know. Yeah, you assume correctly. Oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, it is. It's exactly that, yeah. Because Adrian also starred in your play Red Velvet. Um, yeah. Am I correct that there's a feature film version in the works? There is. We have a great producer, um, some really interesting talent attached to it, Adrian being one of them. Um, and so, yes, it is. It's building. I'm hoping we'll film it later this year. But change, right? Pandemic. Of, <laughs> of course. Congratulations also on Life of Pi, because that's been a massive success for you and deservedly yeah. so. But I mean, that's a magnificent production i mean i've i've seen the specially filmed trailers and things like that yeah. how on earth did you make that happen because that's that seems to me like ambition overdrive you know <laughs> that's... Yeah, yeah absolutely I, I totally agree like everybody said to me how are you going to adapt that book <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because i'm a bit I, I i'm a bit delayed in my responses so i was like oh no i love this book it'll be fine and then by the time we were about to open i thought god they were right what made me think i could adapt this book <laughs> um, so it was a bit of delayed response i loved the book so when i was approached with it i thought oh i know how to do it and i didn't of course i didn't but i had a feeling for it um and then uh, i worked with a brilliant director max webster um, and he helped me hone the story. 
And then we have these fantastic creatives, you know, the puppets, uh, makers and director, Finn Caldwell and Nick Barnes, um, Tim Hatley designed. These epic people came on board. Andrew T. McKay's music. He's a, he's a film scorer in Bollywood. And uh, through a friend, he, we, we found him and he's done this sort of filmic score. And what was very exciting was that all these different elements of video projection, puppetry, story, music, because we had good, good producers behind us, it allowed me to write it all into the script. So that it, rather than they were all put on top of it, it, I could write it all into the script. And it's such a great story. It took me quite a long time to find the, the dramatic structure of it because the book is gorgeous, but rambles in many different directions. So it's not theatrically um, there, the story. But once I found it, it is, it's a good, it's a really, what I love about the play, what I'm proud about, proud of about it is that it is gorgeous, but it also is a really, it's a meal of a piece. You will feel so many things because they, Pi struggles in this play in, in, in ways to survive, to survive being shipwrecked at sea. So I am really, really proud of it. It's meant to come, it was meant to come into town last year, into the West End, but of course, because of pandemic, we didn't. But hopefully, we will be uh, in the West End in the autumn this year. So it'd be lovely to bring it back. You mentioned survival, because I mean, surviving as an actor is, is tough, you know, to, yes. to have a, a career of longevity. Has writing helped you have more control over your, your career? But at what point, because a, a writer can write a long time without earning as, as, as a writer. So... At, at what point did things change for you where you, you could have a kind of dual career, which is, I mean, respect and all credit to you for making it happen. How did you get there and how hard was it to get there? It was really hard. I mean, I started writing maybe five or six years out of drama school because between my acting jobs, I was bored. And I thought I need to do something that sustains me in between. Because no matter how, I mean, I'm not anywhere near like uber successful but I've, I've earned my living from acting mm. but that still means that you have four months off in between jobs two months off you know and, and what do you do when you've suddenly got nothing to do all day so I began writing and I didn't really tell anyone apart from my husband Adrian uh, that I was writing for about 10 years wow. so I just I just did it I thought can I tell stories um let me have a go and so I I I taught myself, I suppose, and I read and I studied. I was doing scripts as an actor all the time, some good, some bad. I learned a lot from all of that. Um, and then I started to come out slowly because it, it, it's a bit, uh, you kind of feel a bit of a fraud saying I'm a writer when you haven't had anything done. So I didn't, I didn't sort of tell anyone because I thought, oh, I'm, I'm not really. What makes me a writer other than that I'm doing it myself? Oh. And then I came out with it because I started to go into the industry and go, would you look at this script? Would you look at these stories? Would you look at this play? And I had limited success, very limited success. I was on the radio a little bit with a drama um, and a short story. And I, I sold short stories to a, to a charity because I think people weren't looking for stories, the kinds of stories I was telling at the time. But the world has changed now. Mm. And uh, when Red Velvet came out, which was my big sort of uh, debut, I guess, my, my coming out properly, uh, it had had five years of projections um, and it's an amazing true story about a black American actor in the 19th century who came to England and had this huge career that was knighted in, in Europe, played across all of Europe and had huge success and was forgotten when he died. That story had been rejected for about five years because nobody was looking for that kind of story. So when it got on, it changed everything. And it was still hard after that, you know, it was a successful play but people didn't come running to me for I wasn't commissioned uh, by anyone really by one one theater so it's it, it's it is it's a really tough if you think oh I'll be a writer that'll be easier than being an actor that's just not true <laughs> that's just not true but and, and lots of people once Red Velvet was successful said oh well you'll have to go up acting then you can't do both but I love acting I just yeah. love it and it feeds both of them feed each other and so I have managed now, after two or three years of keeping going, even though it was difficult, um, I started to get commissions. So Life of Pi was one of them. 
I was commissioned to do Invisible Cities, an Italo Calvino book, with this epic company, 59 Productions, who are digital projectionists, and they did the 2012 Olympics. Oh, That's wow. the scale they work at. And Rombe Dance Company. So there were 22 dancers, a very successful choreographer called Sidi Labi Sherkawi, 59 Productions and Digital Projection, and this play that I wrote in the middle. So I started to do, suddenly, people started coming and finding me, and now I can do both. That was a very long answer. No, I love it. No, it's it's, it's glorious. Well, because also, you say that one feeds the other. When when you're writing dialogue, does the actor in you, when you're writing a character and how they talk, do you imagine the performance an actor may or may not give, or are you listening to the voice of the character? How that I'm guessing that's a discipline you've got to teach yourself so that you're, you're not imagining a certain actor play something, you, you're concentrating on the voice. Yeah, absolutely, because you have to write something, particularly a play, not TV or film, but a play you have to write with hope that it will be done by many companies all over the place. So it's not for one person, although one person will originate it, hopefully, like Red Velvet's had 25, 30 productions in America. So different people have to be able to get into the character from your words. So it's what you said the second time is I'm absolutely doing it from the point of view of the character, which comes very easily because I've that's what I do as an actor. And lockdown hasn't just affected your theatre writing work because you're you're in a big budget BBC series coming up called Vigil. Yeah. Did yeah. that get suspended because of lockdown? Yeah, it did. It was very surreal. We we shot, it's a six-parter, and uh, we did the first, we almost finished the first three, and then it all got locked down for, I think, five months. Wow. And then they were brilliant. They had their COVID protocols. It was very clear. I think it must have been quite very stressful for the producers, but as just a body on the ground who was in it. I thought that their structure was great. So we got tested regularly. We were put in bubbles. We were masked unless we were with the actors we were acting with. You know, things like catering. Often there's tea and coffee and food everywhere um, and lunch. You know, it's a communal thing, but everything was separate. So you had to have your own cup. You had to make your own tea. You had to have your lunch on your own in your dressing room. It was very, very separate but it was safe and you were still sharing space with a crew of 50 people who were keeping socially distant apart from their bubbles, who were all masked. You know, people would go, hi, and you'd think, I don't know who that is, I can't see them. (laughs) (laughs) But we were with people and after five months of being without people, you just go, okay, this is different, but um, here we are. So, and, And so we finished it. So we finished it a few months later. We came back and uh, we did the next three episodes. And tell us about the series and who do you play? Ah, so Vigil is about a submarine, a nuclear submarine. And a detective has to go um, and join them because the nuclear submarine can't surface. It's, the whole point of it is it's meant to be covert and hidden because it is constantly on patrol and a dangerous target for enemy people. So uh, a detective has to go on board because something serious happens played and this detective is played by Suran Jones wow and it escalates on the submarine and there are enemy people and then her counterpart Rose Leslie uh, who is also a detective but is on the ground is, is supporting her investigations has to deal with me so I play Lieutenant Commander Erin Branning and I'm a sort of legal bod in the Navy quite high up under Rear Admiral Shaw played by Stephen Delane uh, and we're all trying to work out what is going on. Oh, exciting. Yeah, it's quite epic and it's different. You know, it's really different. The settings, we filmed it up in Glasgow. I love Glasgow. It's such an amazing city. It's beautiful, beautifully shot and a really impressive cast. So, yeah, it should be. Uh, I'm excited to see it. You know, we, we filmed that first half five <laughs> months earlier. And you came back going, who was I? What <laughs> And then they rewrote a lot of it for the second half because they, because they had to do all these COVID protocols. So scenes where you were with people had gone and things like that. So it was quite hard to keep hold of the story. Mm. And it obviously got better because the writing was tightening and tightening. So I've kind of lost the plot, literally. So it'd be nice to watch it. <laughs> yeah. Well, a, a, a recent telly my wife and I really enjoyed was Criminal. Ah, yeah. Criminal's great, isn't it? It's fantastic. And... 
for a Bill fan, <laughs> it's kind of the closest we may ever get to, yeah. you know, the Bill in all likelihood will never return, which is such a shame, even though the demand is there for some reason. You never know. You, you never, never know. know. If you give it enough time. When when was the last episode? 2010. So it's not quite enough time yet, but there might be boot. You never know. Yeah. But those lovely interrogation scenes, now, of yeah. course, it's a feast, isn't it? And something I, I really admire about you, and I, I wanted to bring up, and so then... Because you brought this quality to Jamila, but I want to talk about it. I, I feel it's quite an interesting and underappreciated element of acting. Is you are a fantastic listener. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're always in the moment, and you're helping tell that story, even when you don't have dialogue. When you actually watch Criminal, you know, there's four of you in that scene, and you're all helping to tell that story in different ways. And yeah. you're always in the moment. Now, how much of that is down to... How much of that for you and from your character's perspective is in the script or how much of that is you bringing it to the table? Talk about that element of it because I find it fascinating watching actors, when they're not speaking, helping deliver the story. So that is something I learnt on the bill, actually. That is absolutely something I learnt because the scenes, the interview scenes we had were often really long. And that's probably why Criminal reminds you of the bill, because this long, I mean, people aren't that brave in a lot of TV now. It's quite cut, change, new scene, put something else in, come back to the scene. Um, and so that's why Criminal felt quite classic, like the bill. I learned that on the bill, because I remember I was on it for two years as Jamila Blake. And, uh, you know, as ever, you get a bit frustrated when you're in episodes and you haven't got much to do. And then you've got other episodes that you've got lots to do, which is great. Um, but the episodes I would watch myself because that's how you learn to see what I'd done wrong and how it came across. And I would see that in scenes where I was part of the um, interrogation, but not necessarily key, not leading it. It was so important how you were engaging with it because screen time is screen time. And listening is part of life, isn't it? You, in life, if you don't listen, None of us are not listening. We're constantly waiting to hear what, how, who, when, what do I do? Should I do something? Should I leave? We're making choices on what you hear. So I absolutely learned that on the bill, that you have to, it's, it's a, it has to be engaged because we're part of the scene for a reason and you're telling a story and you're also in relationship to the other characters in the scene and they need you. What I also love about it is your eye contact when someone's talking to you, and bearing in mind, you know, you were, The Bill was one of your first tell you, oh, you'd, you'd obviously guest starred in it three times, yeah. Yeah. which I think is a record, you know, for a, <laughs> I think so. It's, it's certainly up there. Your eyes dart between both pupils of the person you're listening to. Now, not everyone does that. Now, is that a conscious choice on your part? No, I have no idea I'd do that, no. I find it fascinating um, who does that and who doesn't do that. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, it's really engaging when you see that person looking direct. It's like you're looking directly into their soul to work them out, especially when you're you're listening. There's a great scene you have with Susan Jameson uh, and, and Jim Miller basically gets to the bottom of the plot, works it out, and, and it's brilliant it's brilliant writing and it's brilliantly acted by you because it is basically done by listening and being patient. Yeah. Um, and you're extracting that by watching her, Susan's character's every move to sense that something's not quite adding up. And the way you do that is to pay such close attention to everything she's saying, but you're actually examining both of her pupils, which I think's class. I, I, you know, you're making the most of that moment. I guess the thing about acting is that you, you don't play yourself, but you play versions of yourself. And, uh, and it's really important just to be free in the moment so that you can respond naturally. So in a heightened situation of a drama, uh, how would you respond if I came across a dead body, if I was talking to a murderer, if somebody was going to hit me, how would I naturally respond? Because if you don't have that naturalism about it, people will just switch off. 
And so I guess maybe that's the writer in me listening and paying attention and trying to decipher what does this woman mean? I remember Susan Jameson. She was so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a terrible memory now, you know. If you'd asked me what that episode was, I won't remember. But as you say it, I can see her. Um, well, very successful actress. But, you know, just uh, I, can, I can see her now, yeah. Well, when, when did you discover the acting bug, the storytelling bug? How, how young were you when you discovered? When it clicked? Yeah. I would say I was six when I discovered acting. Uh, just in an assembly at school. I didn't know what it was, but I, it just, the light went on because I went, oh, this is nice. Whatever this is, people are enjoying what I'm doing in this assembly. Um, and the writing, you know, it's retrospectively. I wrote when I was at school. I did public speaking competitions in Birmingham and I, I wrote speeches. So, so it, only retrospectively, though, could I do that. And then I wrote uh, when I was at RADA as training as an actress, I rewrote one of the plays we did because it was really bad. So I, and I didn't know I could, but it was so bad. I thought I can't do any worse than this. So let me just try. Um, and then slowly from there, I, I, I followed storytelling. So I can't really say, but I've always loved reading, reading, watching films, watching TV, theater. I've, I, I've, I kind of like eat that stuff. So stories um, are something I, I, I want. I guess I've absorbed it in some way. Um, were there any performing genes in your family? No, no. What, so what did your parents make of this performer in the family? And My mum my used to want me to be a drama teacher because she, you know, I would say, oh, I haven't got a job. Oh, you know, that job didn't work out. Oh, yeah, I've got this job, but it's only for two weeks. And she just heard all that. And she'd say, well, don't you think you could be a drama teacher? That'd be a bit more regular. And then when I got success, when I, when I was on the bill, I mean, it was very up and down, you know, the bill was great. And then you spend a couple of years doing theatre and not working that often. Um, but when I got the bill and I told her how much I got paid, she went, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad, my dad's a medic, so he's an a orthopaedic surgeon. And he loved it. When I was at school, he was doubtful. And then as soon as I got into RADA, he went into the, to, to, to theatre, to his theatre, to do surgery. And the nurses said, oh, Rada, because that's obviously the one most people have heard of. And he realised it was something. And so he let me go. And, um, he, uh, and he's been so supportive ever since. He loves it. He loves the difference of it and the, the way that you have to juggle all different projects. And it's so interesting. You're never in one place at the same time. So he's really supportive. And who are your heroes, growing up in terms of actors or, or inspirations? They're not necessarily actors and it doesn't quite make sense. So Muhammad Ali. Cool. Um, Sidney Poitier. Uh, those were my two. And Lenny Henry, who's now a friend actually, but Lenny was, you know, Midlands, successful, funny, uh, political. People who were changing the world through what they did um because they had they could see there was something that was needed so those kinds of people and then actors there are so many actors um that i could name whose performances in different things i've gone oh have left me breathless but it's not like they hit it every time i see them that is acting sometimes you are extraordinary hello this is ben payton and you have been listening to the bill podcast produced and presented by oliver crocker Co-produced by Alana Dewar, Dan Evans, Sarah Kuyper, and Alex Mottler. Executive produced by Glenn Allen, Chris Booth, Daniel Christopher, Andrew Dyack, Paul Dunn, George Fairbrother, Erin Gordon, Luke Hegarty, Edward Kellett, James Ledane, Stuart and Jen Morris, Claire Norbury, Justin Pitt, Tom Sherrington, Patrick Stratford, Sarah Went, and Michael Weil. Brought to you in association with georgefairbrother.com and Misty Moon events.